I want to say, first of all, to Mark, where is Mark? It's not that I'm smart, brother. They announced that they were going to be playing volleyball and ping pong. And so I kind of went past the gym. I said, if they're playing basketball, I'm in. But when they started talking about volleyball and ping pong, I decided to go home. So uh, maybe that was the, the better thing to do anyway. But anyway, it's good to be here this morning. Open your Bible, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. And we'll begin reading at verse 1. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, and verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, unto, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces." Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there, were, there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled, and told it in the city, and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus, and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting, and clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Look, if you would, into the same chapter down in verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. It's two very different people. We meet the first man, the man of the tombs, in chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel. He is sometimes referred to as the Gadarene demoniac because he was in the area of the Gadarenes and he was a demon-possessed man. The man had a problem that if we could describe was spiritual of nature. The woman, on the other hand, although she had a physical problem and had a disease that as the scripture says, no doctor could cure. It almost sounds like something 
modern day, doesn't it? She spent all that she had on the physicians, and instead of getting better, she only got worse. And yet she was quite different from that first man. And yet both of them met the Lord Jesus Christ and found in him one that could deal with the problem that other people could not deal with. Two very different people, and yet results very similar. As a matter of fact, there are four stories woven into this chapter or this section that begin in chapter 4. We won't go over them all except just to mention them. It begins in chapter 4 in verse 35 with a storm that no seaman could overcome. And in each of these accounts, the Lord Jesus proves himself superior to whatever the experts were of that day. The men of that day were experienced seamen, and yet there was a storm they couldn't overcome. But the Lord Jesus overcame it. And then we meet a demon-possessed man that no one could deliver. But the Lord Jesus delivered him. And then we meet a death that not even a concerned parent could prevent. Jairus' daughter died, but the Lord Jesus was able even to overcome that death. And then we meet this woman who had a disease that no doctor could cure, and, let, and yet the Lord Jesus was able to heal her and make her whole. And we'll mention more about those as we, as we go along. Well, as was mentioned, my name is Larry Price. I live now near the area of Orlando, Florida. Originally, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. And yet my spiritual roots are to be found in this area of the country in the state of Georgia. I'd like to say that before I share with you the work of God's grace in my life, I'd like to preface it with just a couple of remarks that I think are very important, particularly since we have a number of young people here and even children. But first of all, it is never my desire to glorify the things in my past, many of which I'm ashamed about. And it's certainly not my desire to give any credit or bring any glory to the work of the enemy, whatever work he had a, in and through my life in days gone by. But to magnify the grace of God for what he can do in the life of an individual and what he can do by his power. I also like to say that if you're one of those young people that are here, or perhaps even an older person, and you think, boy, you know, I, I just don't have a testimony like that man has. I never did any of those things. Well, praise the Lord, because you won't carry with you the baggage that some of us carry, and you won't have the material that some of us have in our own lives that we have to struggle with and deal with even now, and if you're one of those young people that are raised with a Christian influence in your life, if you have parents that are concerned enough to try to raise you in the things of God, or maybe it's not even parents nowadays, maybe it's one parent, or maybe it's even a grandparent that tries to raise you and encourage you in the things of Christ you have something to be very thankful for. You have a heritage that I never had, and you have a, a valuable thing. And I trust that you will, if you don't recognize it already, that you will recognize it. I didn't have parents that were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ coming up as a young boy. Church was not on our list of things to do, and my folks were not believers in Christ and weren't concerned about really raising me in that way. I was sent to Sunday school as a young boy until I got old enough to sort of make my own decisions and when I got old enough to more or less do what I wanted to do, I didn't go anymore. I'd heard the gospel many times as a young boy in Sunday school. I could tell you all the facts of the gospel. I could tell you even what it meant to be saved although personally, I had not experienced that. I grew up in a fairly good home, as far as homes that are not Christian can be considered. My parents were 
concern to provide for me and to give me the things that they thought necessary to be able to uh, raise me in the way that they saw fit. And I don't blame anything in my past on my parents. I don't blame it on society. My problem went much deeper than that. And as years would go by, that problem would begin to manifest itself in various ways. I grew up in a very troubled time in the United States of America as a teenager back in the 60s. I know I don't look that old, and it's hard for you to imagine that uh, I was a teenager in the 60s, but it's true. And in the late 60s, middle 60s, you remember it was a very turbulent time, to say the least, here in the United States of America. And many young people were sort of pushing out and, and pushing the limits of authority and, and breaking out of the mold, so to speak, of which they had been in. It was a very disturbing time for many people. Now, again, I know as you look up here and see me, as youthful as I look and appear, and uh, uh, you, you find it hard to imagine that I have children that are actually 20, 19, and 18. But it's true. And sometimes I shudder to think of the things that I was involved in as a young person, much younger than what my children are now. I was about 13 years old when I began to experiment with drugs and alcohol. And at first, it's what you might call a casual experimentation. I wanted to see what it was like. I thought that's what all the, the cool people were doing in my, my school, you know, the ones that I thought were cool. And uh, I wanted to be a part of that. And so I began to experiment. And I began to get involved with the various forms of drugs that were available in that day. And there were, there were quite a few until the time I was... 15 or 16, and there weren't any drugs that were available then that I hadn't done, and there wasn't any way that you could do them that I hadn't done them. And so my life began to take a very dramatic turn, if you will. It was a time when I was really in trouble at home quite a bit, and uh, I had a very simple solution when I didn't want to do what my parents told me. And believe me, in my home there was no lack of discipline, particularly on my father's part. He was a very stern disciplinarian in the old-fashioned sense. But I had a very simple solution. When I didn't want to do what they told me, I simply took off. And I left. And I started running away from home. I remember once when I was about 15, maybe 16, I think I was still 15, I went out to play one afternoon. As I, as I recall, I don't even know if I had any shoes on. I mean, living in Florida, you know, summertime, and just took off to go out to play one afternoon, maybe about 4 o'clock after school, and didn't show up for three months. My parents never knew where I was. They never knew where I had been. I had hitchhiked up to Atlanta, living on the streets, involved in the drug culture that was wide open back in Atlanta in those days. And my parents still wouldn't have known where I was if I hadn't have been picked up by the police and taken to the juvenile shelter. And my mother flew to Atlanta to come and pick me up, which she did more than once. And I used to have weird ambitions. You know, I thought, boy, I'll be glad when I get 17. Back then, you know, when you got 17, you were kind of considered an adult, and then you could go to real jail, and at least you had a chance to bail yourself out and didn't have to worry about your parents coming to get you. That was a noble ambition, wasn't it? My problem was that uh, none of my friends had any money to get me out, nor would they have put up bond for me to get out when I got in trouble. So that wasn't really much to look forward to. But again, my life began to take very dramatic turns, more and more run-ins with the law. Back then, you could get picked up by the authorities for skipping school. If you weren't in school, they picked you up and took you to juvenile shelter. More and more trouble, more and more of a troubled life, and yet less and less ability to stop doing the things that were getting me in trouble blowing every opportunity that ever came along, 
I never finished the ninth grade formally in, in school. I dropped out or was actually there in the ninth grade. I was less in school than I was there, so I never finished the ninth grade as far as my formal education went. And I got into more and more and more trouble. Until the time when I was about 17 or 18 years old, I think I had just turned 17, I was sentenced at that time to the county prison farm in the, sta in the, in the city of Jacksonville for nine months. Working under the shotgun guard, working in the ditches. Sometimes when people ask me, well, what did you used to do? I said, well, I was a roadside engineer for the state of Florida. But um, back then, they didn't have, you know, I, I look now, I think, you know, the good old days, man, back in the chain gang. I mean, these guys got it made. They got gas-operated weed eaters. We used those old Florida lawnmowers, you know, swing blades. And working in the ditches. Well, I got sentenced to nine months. When you're 17 years old, nine months seem like an eternity to me. And I decided the first day that I got there, I was going to escape. And so for the first day, I tried or looked for an opportunity. Second day, no opportunity. Third day, I finally caught an opportunity. And I ran. And I got away. And I stayed gone for six months. Well, they knew that sooner or later that I'd end up doing something to which I'd get caught. And I did. And they caught me. When you escape in the state of Florida, it's a felony. You're facing 15 years. So now I had taken my nine-month sentence and was ratcheting it up to a possible 15 years. I didn't get 15 years. I got 18 months, a year and a half. So as a young man of 18 years old, I entered the Florida State Prison System, 18 years old. And I remember that they put about 60 of us on a bus to take us to the classification center in, in Lake Butler, Florida. And they uh, unloaded us off the bus to, to take us through the sort of orientation. There was a man in there, I still remember him. He was a man named Sergeant Brown. And he was huge. And he had big muscled arms and filled with tattoos up and down his arms and a short cropped haircut. And those cowboy boots, you know, where you can stomp an ant in the corner. And uh, he looked at us all as he got us in the room and he says, let me tell you something. Every, for every ten of you that are in here, eight of you will be back. Now you're going to decide which ones it is. Of course, nobody ever thought they were going to be one of the eight. You always thought you'd be one of the two. Eight of you, eight out of ten of you will be back. Well, the first thing they do is take you in to give you a haircut. And I had enough of it to cut and uh, sat down in the barber chair. Now, before this, my parents used to warn you. I tell this story sometimes. You know, your, your parents sometimes will warn you by picking out a bad person. And they'll say, now, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you're going to end up just like whoever that bad example is. And the bad guy around our, our area was a guy named Johnny Nash. And my parents used to, to warn me by saying, look, if you don't stop what you're doing, you're going to end up just like Johnny Nash. And I heard that so many times. And lo and behold, they sat me down in a barber chair, and an inmate was there to cut my hair, and the inmate was Johnny Nash. And I could hear the words of my parents if you don't stop doing what you're doing, you're going to end up like Johnny Nash. And here was Johnny Nash serving, I don't know how many years, cutting my hair. First time I was in prison. Well, because I had escaped, I had a maximum security rating. So they separated all those 60 men except for two of us. Everybody else went into population. They sent us up into the maximum security cell block. They put me in a one-man cell, a six-by-ten-foot cell, that was designed for one person that, that I've been in as many as with as many as four people before and uh, there was another man already occupying the cell who had 81 years I had 18 months and I want to tell you when they clang those doors shut you talk about an empty feeling hitting in the bottom of your stomach 
You talk about a hopeless feeling of despair. Thoughts begin to plague you. What if something happens to my parents while I'm in here? What if something happens to my relatives? What if something happens to me? Well, I sought to better myself, and through the generosity of the state of Florida, I obtained my general equivalency diploma, my GED. It's probably the only beneficial thing I did while I was in prison. I got out, was released, and got right back into the same lifestyle that I had been in before. And life went on, and I found myself living up in Savannah, Georgia, still living the same type of lifestyle. And not to go into all the details, but I was arrested in Savannah, Georgia, this time for a much more serious charge for robbing a drugstore. Because they couldn't find the, the weapon that was used, they plea bargained with me for a lesser charge, and I ended up with a much lighter sentence than I should have gotten and rightfully deserved. And they sent me to prison, now in the state of Georgia, convicted felon for the second time. And while in the state of Georgia, in the state penitentiary, transferred to the town of Hardwick, Georgia, near Milledgeville, I sought to better myself. You know, I thought, well, they offer some college courses here. So I took a few college courses and had a man that was teaching a psychiatrist or a psychology course. And I, I thought, you know, now, that's what I need to do. You know, if I can learn what makes the mind tick, I can really get a hold of life. Maybe education's the answer. So I thought, well, I'm going to try to better myself and educate myself. They took about... 60 or 65 of us, they had a novel drug rehab program. They put us all up on one floor. Everybody there was for drug-related crimes. And they put us all up on this floor, and we had an in-house drug rehab program. They had a, an organizational chart, and uh, somehow or another I had fast-talked my way along with one other man to be in the head over all that whole floor of inmates. There were two free world men that were over us, free world men, you know, the guys that come and go during the day. But as far as running the floor was concerned and running the drug program was concerned, me and this other inmate were over the whole floor. And I remember that they came down to interview the program. The Atlanta Constitution came down to interview about this program because at that time it was a novel program in the state. And uh, they interviewed a bunch of us and uh, sitting in a room. And I guess because I like to talk a lot, I said a lot of things. And they ended up quoting a lot of things that I said in that article. The last thing that, that they quoted sort of to end the article was a statement that I made at the time. And the statement went something like this. Prison can never rehabilitate you. You have to rehabilitate yourself. And I began to really believe that that's what it was. I had the power within myself to change my own life. What a deception. Really, the only thing that, that was accomplished by me being the head of that drug program in there was that it made it easier access for me to be able to get drugs in the prison, which I was still doing while I was telling other people how to stop doing drugs. <laughs> you figure it out. I finally engineered what was called an educational release. I think at that time, if I'm not mistaken, I was only the second inmate in the state to ever get one. And if you've heard of a work release program, it's similar, but instead of being released to go to a, a place to work, I was released to a halfway house and released to go to college at Georgia College in Milledgeville. I was there less than one semester, and all of a sudden, as some friends came to pick me up from the town of Savannah and to take me back there on a weekend, I found myself arrested again. Initially stopped in the little town of Harlem, Georgia, and then taken back to McDuffie County Jail in Thompson, Georgia. And when I finally sobered up enough to realize what I had done, because I had been half out of my mind, 
And I realized that I was going back to prison for the third time because I was really still out on parole. I knew that if for nothing else, I was going back for parole violation. And then when I realized I was facing a sentence of at least 20 years if convicted and given the maximum, I want to tell you that sense of despair began to settle in again. You know, there were times in my life when I thought I'd like to change. I'd like to stop getting in trouble all the time and living like I do all the time. But I couldn't find the power to be able to change my life. And as I sat in that little dark cell in the bottom downstairs in McDuffie County, for the first time in my life, I entertained thoughts of suicide. I had never been suicidal. I had never considered taking my own life. I was always a person who ran. I was always a person who said, there's got to be some way out of this. And anybody who takes their own life is a fool because there's always a way out. Until I got to such a point of despair that suicide seemed a real option. As I began to think, if there's nothing better than this, if this is all life is about, if I've got to go from one drunk to the next, one high to the next, one jail sentence to the next, and I've got to go to prison again, and there's nothing else, well, I might as well just end it all right here. But the Lord had other plans, and the Lord intervened. You know, they uh, gave me a phone call, and I had never heard of Thompson, Georgia, except for one, one time, well, in one way I had heard of it. One of the free world men that was over the drug rehab program was from Thompson, Georgia. And that's the only time I'd ever heard of it in my life. So here I was in Thompson, I said, I'm going to give him a call. I got one phone call, can't call anybody else, don't know anybody else around here. So I picked up the phone and dialed his house, and he wasn't home. But his parents were there. Now, his parents were believers in the Lord Jesus, and they decided to come down to that jail and visit me. They didn't know me from Adam. Matter of fact, their son later told him, don't have anything to do with him. He's a loser. He just uses people. He deceives people because I was a great disappointment to him in that drug rehab program. But they came. And I thought to myself when those people stood on the other side of that little window visiting me, why are those people here? <laughs> What's the matter with them? Surely they've got to have something better to do to come down here and visit somebody like me. But they came down there and visited me and told me about the Lord Jesus and they left me a little New Testament to read, along with some other things. And they didn't stop coming then. They kept coming. I walked into a Bible study one Tuesday afternoon. I still remember it, all those years ago. And there was a man there that came to visit. He lived in Aiken at the time and uh, would drive all the way from Aiken twice a week back and forth from Aiken to Thompson to visit two young men that were in prison there at the time, men that he didn't know, but he got a call from a concerned parent out in California who said, can you visit my boy? So he and his wife would come. They began coming twice a week to that jail, and they had a Bible study. And in that Bible study, he was speaking from John chapter 2, which if you know is the, the wedding at Cana. And I thought as he opened that passage of Scripture, as I sat in that Bible study, I thought, that has absolutely nothing to do with me. <laughs> but the Spirit of God began to speak to me through that passage of God's Word. And I went back to my cell eventually, and there in the cell that I was in, you know, I began to cry out to the Lord. I told you that I'd been suicidal. And down in the bottom of that cell in my despair, I prayed, if you want to call it a prayer, one of the simplest things that a person can ever cry out, and I, I've become a, a much more of a stickler for correct doctrine over the years, 
But I prayed probably what was one of the most untheological prayers you can pray. I cried out, God, help me. And I really believe that the Lord read the words of my heart more than he did the words of my lips. And over the next few days, because there was really a, a unique thing happening in that jail at the time, I uh, would come across a gospel track. You know, those little pieces of paper that have Bible verses on them and things. And I'd read that gospel track and it'd say, Now, if you want to be saved, do these four things, whatever they were. Believe, confess, repent, I don't know what they were. And I'd do those four things. And then I'd get another track and it'd say, If you want to be saved, do these six things. Acknowledge, confess, repent, whatever they were. And I'd do those six things. I want to be sure I had it right. And I was reading that little New Testament, and the, the thought came to me. I said, you know, I wonder where I could turn in this Bible if, if I wanted to tell somebody how to be saved. Where could I turn to tell them? And like a flash, it came to me. I hadn't thought about it in years. The first time I'd ever gone to prison, uh, a woman that I knew in Jacksonville had written me a letter. And on the bottom of the letter, she didn't even write the, the verse out to the best of my memory. All she wrote down was the reference. And as I sat there thinking about where could I turn in the Bible if I wanted to tell somebody how to be saved, I could see it just as clear in my mind, Romans 10.13. And I opened my Bible to Romans 10.13 and I read these words. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That woman had written me that letter all those years ago. I'd had no contact with her in, in years. And the Lord brought that to my heart and to my mind. And I believed at that moment that I could use that verse to show somebody else how to be saved and that I could believe that verse and that I could be saved. And I want to tell you, if you're here this morning, if you're listening, you can believe that verse and you can be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It couldn't be simpler than that, could it? What a beauty, and yet a profound statement it is. And my life began to change. All of a sudden, I noticed that the Lord began to take those desires away from me that I had. And all of a sudden, I began to notice that he put something new there, a desire and a hunger for his word. I had that little New Testament and I had already read it through once. I was already halfway through it the second time and you know I'd just come out of that little bit of smattering of college that I'd had and so I thought you know there really ought to be underlining some of this stuff so I started I said I'm gonna have to go back I finished it the second time underlining and then I said I missed the first half so I went back the third time and started reading and underlining scripture only gonna underline the good parts and by the time I'd finished, I'd read that New Testament three times in two weeks, and almost every verse was underlined, <laughs> because I only wanted to underline the good stuff. And, and yet, the Lord was allowing me to be able to understand His Word. I'll never forget what a revelation that was, that, that book that had been closed to me before, now I could read it, and it began to make sense. Somebody turned the light on. And all those things that that I desired before, the Lord began to take away. I still had to face the judge. And God very mercifully gave me a much shorter sentence than what I rightfully deserved. But I was sent from McDuffie County Jail to a place called Tobacco Road, RCCI. And there, once again, I found myself working in the ditches, this time a roadside engineer for the state of Georgia still using the old-fashioned swing blade under the shotgun guard. But what a difference. First thing I did, I got there on a Thursday. I said, anybody out there have a, do you any, know anything about a Bible study? They said, well, there's a man that comes on Friday night and Monday night. There were two men that were here at Bethany Chapel back then. One of them was with the Lord now. And Sidney Temple and Tommy Westbrook were having the Bible study out at RCCI. I remember the first night I walked in on a Friday and they announced the subject was going to be something like the book of Esther and the book of, 
of numbers, and I thought, oh, man, what have I got myself into? But as they began to just simply teach the Word of God, it was like manna to my soul. And they, they said, you know, we've got these Bible study courses we'd like you to try, these Emmaus Bible study courses. And I didn't have a clue what that was. But they gave me one on Friday night, the, what the Bible teaches. And I gave it back to them on Monday night, finished. And so they gave me one on the book of Acts, which is a much thicker course. And I gave them back that Friday night, finished. And that went on for about nine months till I'd done 26 of those courses. I began to learn the Word of God. I used to ask them, I said, what denomination are you all from? They'd give me all these, what I thought were weird answers, you know, well, we, we go to this place and we're not really a denomination. I said, who's the pastor over there? And they'd say, well, we don't really have a pastor. We've got elders that function in that capacity. It was all strange to me. But I knew one thing. These men were bringing before me the word of God. And it was what I, I needed. Memorize scripture. They said, you know, you, you need to memorize scripture. People would say, well, I can't memorize. They'd say, what's your phone number? Or what's your prison number? 036694, still remember. Y32017, still remember those. Well, once you could memorize one number, you know, you could memorize something else. So it would give you a scripture. Once you memorize one, that meant you could do two. And so I memorized about 300 scriptures. Five chapters at that time Scripture perfect of the book of Romans. All 96 verses in A.P. Gibbs' personal evangelism course. So now when I went out on the chain gang to work, I had a pocket filled with Bible verses, and on the bus I had a Bible, and I'd read the Bible on the way, and all day while I was working in the ditch, I was talking to the Lord and memorizing Scripture and realizing for the first time in my life, though I was in prison and still had a sentence to serve, that I was a free man, that the Son had made me free, and that those things that had held me into bondage before, I'd been delivered from. You know, this will take you back. I had a little transistor radio. And it was hard to get stuff in, in there because of all the metal, you know. But uh, every now and then I could pick up this little station. I don't know where it was at. And I'd fiddle with that little radio and try to get it to work. And there was a, 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 a station that played some Christian music. And... Uh, I remember hearing a song in there one time. I don't know who wrote it. I don't remember all the words, but there was one chorus of that song that I thought was especially fitting for me. And it went something like this. It said, like a man locked up in prison with no one to go my bail. Every time I sought for freedom, all endeavors only failed. There I was in sin's dark dungeon, bound in chains of misery to the Lord paid me a visit, unlocked my cell, and set me free. And that's what happened with me. I met the Lord Jesus Christ. He did what people couldn't do. You know, it says here in this account we had in Mark chapter 5 that this, this man had been bound many times by chains and by ropes and by fetters. And to me, that's, that's like man's methods. I didn't need a method when I was in jail when I was in drugs, when I was in crime and criminal behavior. I didn't need a technique. What I needed was a savior. I needed someone who could save me. And part of salvation, and part of the very meaning of that word, means deliverance. And that's what it was for me, deliverance. You know, that man, that demoniac man, it said he cut himself with stones his behavior was abusive. Why did he want to hurt himself that way and punish himself continually over and over again? And he couldn't break that cycle until he met the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that could stop his abusive behavior. He was in despair, night and day, crying out. I relate so much to that man. But you know, I purposely mentioned the story of that woman who was quite different from that man. She wasn't demon-possessed. She didn't have the same problem that he had, but she needed a Savior. 
She needed one that could make her whole. And that word whole is the same word for salvation. She met the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the story? She came pressing through the crowd, and she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, and she did, and immediately the flow of blood that she had stopped. But it didn't stop there, did it? The Lord Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? And the disciples, perceptive as they usually were not, said, Lord, there's a big crowd around you. And he says, no, this was different. And he called that woman out of the crowd, not to embarrass her, but for a very important reason. You see, she could never go away from that place, and people say, how'd your blood stop? How'd your disease get healed? And she says, well, I just touched the hem of his garment. And people would have said, well, boy, if we could just get a piece of that, that garment, if we just had a piece of that robe. No. You see, he confronted her personally, and then he said to her those words, Thy faith hath saved thee. Only the Lord can read the heart when it comes to faith, but the point there is that salvation is a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus himself. And so I don't know where you are this morning as you're here. Maybe your life is similar to mine. Maybe it's totally different. But the point of the thing is the same that Christ Jesus is a Savior of sinners. And you have to come to Him and confess the fact that you're a sinner. didn't take much convincing with me. When you realize that you've sinned, you'll realize that what you need is a Savior. And the Spirit of God will reveal to you that that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior He is. And when it began to dawn on me, Larry Price three-time convicted felon, criminal, dopehead, lowlife, the last person in the world you'd ever want to have around your house, in your home, around your family, when it began to dawn on me that the Lord Jesus Christ loved me enough that he came into this world and died for me, somebody like me. He came into this world to give his life on that cross that, that I could be saved and my sins forgiven, and that the reality of God's word that says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, that that could be true. Oh, what a revelation that is. And so I commend to you today the Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of sinners, the only one that's able to forgive your sin because of what he did on Calvary's cross. And he died to provide that salvation. Well, obviously, I got released from prison. And I went back to the town that I was from, Jacksonville, Florida. And there I met the woman who's now my wife. And that's, as Paul Harvey would say, page two, the rest of the story. And I won't take up the time to tell you that today, except to mention the fact that in 1992, after a very prolonged series of investigations and application with the state of Georgia and also the state of Florida, I had the privilege, my wife and I, of going to the capital of Florida, Tallahassee, and standing before the governor and the cabinet and receiving from Governor Lawton Childs at that time a complete pardon for everything that I had ever done. And as I stood before the governor there, I wanted to be sure that they recognized that it wasn't because Larry Price was some wonderful guy that finally cleaned up his act. It was interesting that during the investigation, I had a sheaf of letters and recommendations from various people, doctors, lawyers. At the time, I was involved in a Bible study with three pharmacists. I said, boy, the Lord does have a sense of humor, doesn't he? <laughs> One day... Uh, one of these pharmacists was riding with me to a conference somewhere. I invited him to go, and he, he'd only known me a couple of weeks or so. And, and so as we got going down the road, we were headed for North Carolina. He said, uh, well, tell me, how is it that you came to know the Lord? And so I started telling him a little bit about my past and my background, and all of a sudden I noticed it got awfully quiet in the car. Later on, he told me that when we stopped for gas, he, he got out and called his wife. He said, Marcia, if I don't make it home, let me tell you, you're not going to believe who I'm in the car with. 
One day I was up in Birmingham, Alabama a couple years ago, and I've got a friend there who's a supervisory capacity in the FBI, and he's been on the Bureau probably now close to 20 years. And so I went to visit him. He says, well, while you're here, come on down. I'll give you a tour of the office. So he told me where to go. We got into an elevator. We went up the elevator to a floor that didn't exist on the elevator, and uh, we got off. And we went through this secure foyer there with, you know, inch and a half thick bulletproof glass and everything else you can imagine to get back into the secure area where all the offices and all were. And we're walking down the hall, and he says, now this is an office here, and this is another this, and this is that. And we rounded a corner, and there was a big door, like a bank vault door. And it was open about that far. And so he said, I wonder who left that thing open. So he walked inside. I followed him in, and I found myself standing in the middle of the armory. And all around the room, there were fully automatic weapons of every kind, grenade launchers, tear gas, ammunition stacked to the ceiling. And all of a sudden, it hit me. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled. I thought, isn't this something? Here I am standing in the middle of FBI headquarters with this man in the middle of the armory. If that isn't the grace of God, I wanted those men in the governor's cabinet and the governor to know that it wasn't Larry Price that did it. So I'd prepared a little package for each of them with a, a booklet, that booklet, Ultimate Questions, if you've seen it, and some gospel literature, and a little note that just said, I want you to know that it wasn't Larry Price that changed his life. It was the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of his gospel that did it. To him be the glory, and to him be the praise. And I gave one of those to each, the governor and, and all of his cabinet members. And that's the real message today. I don't know where you are in your life. If you're a believer in Christ, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you in the power of the gospel. That person that you look out there and you look at them and you think, now that person's a loser, and they may well be. But the Lord Jesus can redeem that life, save that person, and make something out of them. If you're here today as a young person, I want to, I want to challenge you that there's a way which seemeth right unto men but the end thereof are the ways of death. I haven't told you the rest of the story in fullness. The story about most of the men that I ran around with who are today all dead. Probably the six closest friends that I, I had are all dead of either drug overdose or drug-related accidents, except for the first. He was the first funeral I ever preached. And as a young man in his early 20s, escaped from prison and on the run from the law, found himself cornered in a house. And in the closet of the house, when he knew the police had surrounded him, he pulled out his pistol and he shot himself, killed himself. And the parents called me to do the funeral because they heard that I was religious now. It wasn't a happy ending in that sense for all the men that I ran around with. So don't kid yourself and think, boy, if he made it through... I can go out and do what I want to do, and it'll end up all right. It doesn't always. And then mostly my heart goes out to you today if you're not saved, and you're here this morning, and you don't know the Lord Jesus in reality. I can tell you right now, religion's not going to do it. Church membership's not going to do it. Your folks being Christians isn't going to do it. Your good works and efforts aren't going to do it. It's coming to the Lord Jesus. And recognizing your sinful condition before a holy and a righteous God. Not to say, well, I'm not as bad as he was or I'm better than she is. But to recognize it before a holy and a righteous God. All have sinned and come short of the very perfection that God himself is. And if you recognize yourself as a sinner like that, you're a candidate for the salvation that the Lord Jesus has provided came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And if you'll simply look to him and recognize what he did on that cross, and call on his name, the Lord will honor his word and save you. Let's just look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. We thank you for the salvation that is in him. We thank you for the life-changing power that the gospel has and how it can take a person who's bankrupt, corrupt, defiled and change that life and make something out of it. 
We thank you, too, that you can, through your spirit, take a person who's a, a good person, a moral person, but a person that needs to be saved nonetheless, and show them that in your sight, all of their righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and they need to be saved, and they need to have their life changed and their sin forgiven, only available through the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Father, if there are any here that are unsaved today, we pray that even now, as the Spirit of God speaks to their hearts, that they might turn to the Lord Jesus, cry out to Him, believe on Him, and be saved. We give you thanks that Christ is the Savior of sinners. We give you thanks in His name.